Wisconsin. I'm Kathy Allen, the chair of the Cooley Region Sierra Club Group in Southwest Wisconsin. We are co-hosting this program with the Chippewa Valley Group, the Fox Valley Group, the Four Lakes Group, and the Wisconsin Chapter. As we begin this event, we recognize that Wisconsin occupies the ancestral homelands of the Ojibwe, Menominee, Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Dakota people. We acknowledge these indigenous communities and the additional Native American sovereign nations currently within the state who have stewarded this land throughout the generations and we honor their legacy of resistance and resilience. Before we get to our speakers, we just have a couple announcements. First, we will be keeping everyone except the speakers on mute during the presentation to avoid accidental interruptions. But if you have any technical issues, please put them in the chat and our amazing chapter staff member Cassie will do her best to help you out. We are recording the event so our members who couldn't be here tonight will be able to enjoy tonight's conversation as well. We have one upcoming event to share and that is the chapter's virtual volunteer fair on Thursday, February 3rd at 6 30 p.m. If you want to learn more about what the Sierra Club does in Wisconsin and how you can volunteer then this is the event for you. You'll hear about our many volunteer opportunities, what it means to be a volunteer with the Wisconsin chapter and meet with other volunteers. Cassie has shared the link to the RSVP for that event in the chat, or you can visit the chapter website for more information. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest tonight. Sarah Godlewski was born and raised in Eau Claire. Her parents were both public school teachers and proud union members. She learned early that when you see something wrong, you stand up and do something about it. Whether it was confronting state leaders in college, tackling problems at the Pentagon as a young professional, or taking on Scott Walker himself in 2018, Sarah has always been fearless in taking on the powerful and winning. As a fifth generation Wisconsinite, working mom and state treasurer, Sarah understands what workers and families are facing and will do something about it. She will roll up her sleeves to get the job done. Instead of trying to divide our state for political gain, Sarah is traveling everywhere to unite Wisconsinites across all 72 counties and build a grassroots coalition. Sarah lives in Wisconsin with her husband, Max, their adorable almost two-year-old son, Hartley, and their rescue dog, Tanner. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Kathy. It's great to be here, everyone. And Tia Nelson, also a Wisconsin native, is internationally recognized as a champion for environmental stewardship and climate change education. She spent 17 years with the Nature Conservancy in government relations as a policy advisor for Latin America and later as the first director of the Global Climate Change Initiative. Tia then returned home to serve as executive secretary to the Wisconsin Board of Commissioners of Public Lands which included a gubernatorial appointment as co-chair of Wisconsin's Task Force on Global Warming. She most recently worked as the managing director of the Outrider Foundation's climate program. And of course, she's the daughter of Gaylord Nelson, former Wisconsin governor, senator, and founder of Earth Day. Thank you, Tia. Thank you, it's great to be with you guys. We are so grateful to have both of you here tonight. To begin, can you each tell us a little more about your experience in our state government and your involvement in environmental issues? Let's start with Tia. Oh, uh, thanks so much, Kathy. And I, I really uh, appreciate the efforts uh, that you've put into this event and, and the efforts that uh, uh, Sierra Club uh, uh, engages in to protect uh, clean air and clean water. And, our forests and address the issues of climate change. Um, you do such important advocacy work and I just wanna thank all your members for joining us uh, for this conversation this evening. Um, I, I suspect that I, I uh, have uh, an earlier start uh, to uh, one's uh, political musings and career than uh, most. I, I think I was 10 when I first sat in the US Senate gallery and. Uh, watched a, a floor debate that my father was leading. And uh, I worked on my first campaign when I was 12, though I don't recall ever getting a paycheck for it. Um, so I, uh, I have a degree in wildlife ecology. I gravitated towards the policy side of uh, 
uh, environmental studies. And uh, my first um, uh, job in state government around that was as the committee clerk for the uh, Wisconsin Assembly Natural Resources Committee, uh, where we shepherded uh, at the time the most comprehensive groundwater protection legislation in the country uh, through the legislature and signed by um, uh, Governor Tony Earl. And uh, that taught me how a bill becomes a law. It taught me the benefits of having advocacy groups like Sierra Club and Nature Conservancy and League of Conservation Voters and uh, Clean Wisconsin, uh, though it had a different name at the time. They all played a critical role in advancing um, that really um, significant legislation. So that was a very formative uh, uh, time for me, working in state government and watching the process and the wheels of government and lawmaking um, uh, work their way through the process. And I loved it. And um, after about five years, I went to Washington where I joined the government relations team at the Nature Conservancy's uh, global headquarters and where I worked for the next 17 years in a variety of capacities, as you've mentioned. And then uh, I got weary of, of all of that and, and homesick. So uh, I moved back to Wisconsin to become executive secretary of the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands, which was a dream job uh, running a small uh, agency that few people know about, but which uh, significantly impacts uh, the livelihoods of, of every citizen in the state of Wisconsin in a variety of ways. And um, that, was a, that was a great gig until it wasn't. Um, I, I, uh, some of you may know I came under uh, attack from uh, the former state treasurer uh, for talking about climate change during work hours. Um, and which led to uh, uh, me being censored and, and a variety of um, rather Orwellian uh, um, events. Um, and uh, uh, I've been at BCPL about 11 years. And at that time, um, uh, the Outrider Foundation approached me and asked me if I wanted to help them start a new climate education program. And so, once I had everything, staff and budget and the agency in good order, I um, uh, stepped aside and joined uh, Outrider from which I just retired, um, but remain active in, in, in my life's work, which is environmental advocacy. And Sarah, how about you? Well, I just also want to say um, it's so great to be here with everyone um, and also share that, you know, I knew Tia Nelson way before she ever knew me um, as a proud, you know, fifth generation Wisconsinite. Most of my family actually comes from basically where Tia's dad grew up, um, Senator Nelson. And I think it was like one of the first things that you learn about is who started Earth Day? And where did Earth Day even come from? And so being a product of public schools, knowing that it started in Western Wisconsin by this very visionary leader named Gaylord Nelson, um, it's just, as you know, part of who we are as Wisconsinites. And whether you know it was my dad taking me down like the Brule River or the Nimicagan and just like learning about how important conservation is to being that, you know, kind of kid in, in elementary school and middle school where we were recycling all the time um, to trying to, you know, our work to save the wolves because this is at a time when wolves population was particularly under attack. Um, it's just been, I think, a part of who I am and my environmental work for a while has been more in that kind of voluntary capacity um, being a Wisconsinite, that we all, you know, loving our, our state and doing what we can to protect it. I will say that that, that moment in government and kind of making this more of a career changed for me when, believe it or not, I got involved in finance. Um, I was a co-founder for an impact investment firm and something that we really believed in and we worked um, every day to implement was environmental standards and how we think about our investments and educating the public on it 
you know, one of our companies um, is actually uh, the one of the co-founders is right from right here in Wisconsin, and it is helping to transition from brown energy to green energy by empowering consumers to help drive the grid to want to purchase green energy, and it's called called Arcadia Power. And I know even it's been featured right here with the Sierra Club. And so I um, was really proud of that, of that work and that eventually, believe it or not, in responsible investing, um, led me to the state treasurer's office where I got to meet somebody that I've always been in awe of, Tia Nelson, through her work um, as the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands, because this office um, is one of the commissioners and currently I chair the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands. And you know, just to kind of start off this conversation, my first major action right after I was elected um, as state treasurer was overturning the Republican gag order that Tia was just talking about, where we couldn't even talk about climate change as it impacts our public lands or our investment portfolio. And not only is that wrong from like a moral perspective, but as a fiduciary, it's just absolutely reckless and um, proud of the work that we have done um, moving forward. But that was really my, my entrance into state government was overturning um, a gag order on climate change. Who knew, Kathy, who knew? Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the role that um, the BCPL could play in promoting um, clean energy for public, public, um, gov I guess both governments and agencies, like especially for schools? Yeah, so let's talk about uh, clean energy in particular, and maybe even Kathy, move into what we've done, because I'm really proud of the work that we have done and something that I have really embraced in this role, and I'm sure many of you on today's Zoom can um, also recognize is it's not like our current legislature is really always moving the needle on this topic. And so always it was kind of a thought process on what can we do um, within kind of our scope of responsibility. And one of the things um, that I'm always I'm really proud about is the work that partnerships that we have developed with local government and how local governments can actually address climate change, particularly their carbon footprint head on. And our relationship with local governments has been actually working with them to finance solar panels on their wastewater treatment centers or on one of their utilities. So we have done this now with a few local governments, most notably one of them is actually in the uh, town of Washburn where we put solar panels on their wastewater treatment plant, it not only is gonna save them money because they're now cutting their costs because they don't have to pay for it, they're generating their own power through their solar panels. On top of that, believe it or not, they're generating a revenue stream because they're producing so many green credentials, they're putting green credentials on the grid and they're getting paid for that. And then they're about um, on track now to be carbon neutral. And one of the last estimates I heard was in the last decade that they will be carbon neutral. So you're saving money, you're creating a revenue stream, and you're going to be carbon neutral. This is a win-win. And we are now working with more and more um, communities across the state um, because we just can't wait for whether it's state government or I would argue federal government, like we've got to do this stuff, this stuff um, now. The other thing, Kathy, that I will just also can share is that when you chair a $1.2 billion investment fund, um, you have a voice at the table when it comes to how these companies are invested. And so one of the other big pillars that we have worked really hard on is holding companies accountable for their environmental standards. So something that I have worked on is bringing other treasurers together, knowing our work in the investment space. And we called, for example, JP Morgan Chase. They were going to uh, appoint, reappoint ExxonMobil's chair to chair JP Morgan. Well, let me tell you, he didn't care about environmental standards. He definitely wasn't having their company uphold any of that stuff. And actually through pressuring JP Morgan Chase, he was not reelected. Um, because we as, you know, stakeholders said enough is enough. And the same thing is true with ExxonMobil. You know, ExxonMobil has made a commitment to uphold their emission standards um, and their environmental green plan by 2050. 
And we continue to hold them accountable to achieving that because you just, um, you can't take anything for granted. And I think we've got to think about how we are using our voice in ways that really matter and move the needle. That is fantastic. Climate change is actually one of the Sierra Club's highest priorities, both nationally and here in Wisconsin. And one of the primary ways that we have been advocating for that is by promoting clean renewable energy and ending fossil fuel use as soon as possible. And it seems like this is an area where our state has kind of fallen behind our neighbors. And that's at least partly due to government policies. You've given us one great example. Are there other ways that we can overcome this and become a leader in clean energy and climate action? Um, Sarah, if you wanna tell us a little more and then we'll switch to Tia. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that it is a few things, right? I think one is continuing to partner, as um, I mentioned, with local governments. We uh, worked with actually the conservation voters on creating a toolkit, for example, on how to do this, um, because there is local control and that does matter. Uh, you know, the other thing that I will say is that um, we're a manufacturing state. And I actually recently um, met with a major manufacturer up in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and 90% of what they do is make parts for the combustion engine. And they know that is not the future. They want to be able to actually transition in what they do every day for the clean energy economy. But one of the things that they have talked about is how can we, for example, help support them to making that transition? But for example, by uh, training folks by, you know, aligning to the supply chain. And so that is something that um, we've been in conversations with that I think is really important that state government and also both federal government, because as we know, as we transition to this clean um, energy economy, it's about jobs here in Wisconsin. And I think we all can agree that we want to be leaders, not laggers um, in this work. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities and we are working on them now to do that. Tia, your thoughts? Uh, well, it's, uh, um, I had to smile when Sarah mentioned the internal combustion engine. If, if uh, anybody in the audience wants to look at an interesting passage in the congressional record, I, I wish if I'd thought of it, I could have looked up the year. It would take a little bit of time. But my father introduced legislation to ban the internal combustion engine um, many, many years ago. Um, he was trying to make a point. It uh, seemed like an unrealistic thing at the time, um, though I think he, he, he did see a future uh, uh, in which that was not our primary um, uh, technical means. Uh, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, the UAW in, uh, endorsed that legislation. And um, it's, it's, a fascinating, it's fascinating to listen to his words there. When it comes to clean energy policy in the state, we, you know, one thing to keep in mind is there's a number of actors here. There's the legislature making laws. There's the Public uh, uh, Service Commission, um, uh, three members appointed by the uh, governor um, uh, who are considering uh, the uh, regulatory oversight of the utilities. There's the role of the utilities. Uh, municipalities, as Sarah pointed out, play a really critical uh, role. Um, when the uh, federal government was lagging on renewable energy, the leadership in this country that was really shifting the conversation was coming from municipal officials, towns, cities, villages, counties, and states. Um, and they were the leaders and they were pushing the envelope. And th there are many examples of important federal uh, uh, environmental laws. Um, uh, the Clean Air Act would be a perfect example in which states stepped up to take uh, a leadership position in regulating an issue and that you know, forced industry to seek to have some uniformity and, and, and a, a federal law was adopted. But uh, the public has such an important role to play um, in um, uh, creating the political will. And one of the things that's much too 
to the benefit of the cause now is it just doesn't make any economic sense to invest in coal, right? Renewables are cheaper and they're not just uh, uh, cleaner. Um, they don't just impact public health and the public health impacts are, are, are enormous, um, uh, but they're um, more cost effective. And so I think uh, organizations like the Sierra, Sierra Club have an important role to play in um, advocating on those issues. I think the economics are in the favor. I think municipal officials uh, from the town, villages, counties, uh, uh, and cities are playing an important role and leading by example uh, because it makes sense. And uh, I think it's fairly telling that um, there, within the last few years, a new group opened up shop, a conservative uh, a clean energy group opened up shop in Madison to lobby um, a um, Republican legislature on um, wise clean energy policies. And I, I, I think it's unfortunate that the legislature um, has lagged uh, behind, but um, they're accountable to the voters and um, and I see, a, you know, a, a youth are having an enormous impact uh, on this issue. If you look at the Yale Climate Communications Project data and they pull every uh, twice, uh, twice a year for the last 10 years on a, a particular set of questions around the public's belief on climate change and their views on climate change. And there's almost no difference between young Republicans and young Democrats when it comes to the strength of their support for clean energy policies. You get a lot of disparity as you go through the older demographics, but um, uh, this is something that's forcing uh, Republicans to uh, uh, take notice. Um, and I think there's a growing political will for, I think it's been too slow and too little, uh, but but it's, it's coming and I think uh, advocacy groups and the public have a really critical role to play. Kathy, I just wanna also chime up of what um, Tia has said because we know that this is such an important issue. I mean, La Follette School, the, our, the public policy school here in Madison recently released a survey on what Wisconsinites care about. And guess what the number one issue was? Um, and this was from the general electorate, like just general Wisconsinites. Um, it, it was climate change by far. Wow. And um, if you haven't looked at this uh, La Follette survey, it's very fascinating to see how it was overwhelming um, a top issue. But look, like when you look at Wisconsin, when you look at our heritage and who we are, like this has always been a huge part of kind of our existence and why we love our state. Um, the only other piece too that I want to kind of mention as far as kind of action and what we can start doing is um, kind of going back to the investment community, you know, something that I think is incredibly important is that when we look at how, for example, our pension plans are invested, something that we have asked for over and over again is for these companies to just automatically report on their environmental standards and provide transparency and accountability, because right now we have no way of really tracking that. And I think this is a really important action that we have been working with, whether it is Department of Labor um, to even the SEC. And I will tell you under the previous administration, under the Trump administration, too many fossil fuel companies were uh, ruling their decision-making and trying to make it even harder for somebody like me as a state official to make these smart decisions. Um, and so I think that's also something that, you know, it's behind the scenes, but it's really, really important because we can't hold corporations accountable if we don't have that insight and transparency and accountability into it. That's a great point. Um, we are going to switch gears a little bit. Another one of the Sierra Club's highest priorities um, in Wisconsin is clean water. We've been advocating for regulations on high capacity wells, nutrients from industrial agriculture, including CAFOs, and of course, PFAS. We see these as essential to protect both human health and our natural resources, but the state government has not taken strong legislative action. Do you have any insight into what the holdups are and any thoughts on how we could overcome them? Uh, Sarah, let's go to you first. Well, as I just 
talked about this to me is kind of is mind boggling. And part of the reason why it's mind boggling is it is clear that the environment is a top issue that people think about. Uh, whether you are in Milwaukee and worried about the water quality and your green spaces and runoff um, to literally in rural Wisconsin, as you talked about, um, we're talk working with the PFAS that are polluting our waterways and our drinking ways, our, our waterways and our lakes. Um, I'll be honest, I don't fully understand why legislation hasn't been moved forward. I mean, we have right now the Clean Water Act, uh, which would finally ensure that communities had the gold standards and how we address PFAS um, and make sure that we're accountable and we can test and we can treat. Um, but that just unfortunately um, hasn't been able to go anywhere. And um, what's ironic is Senator Hansen from Green Bay is the one who initially sponsored that legislation because he knew it was important for his district. But since then, the person who has taken over in his seat is not um, moving in that in that direction. Um, and so I think it goes back to uh, making sure that our voices are heard and the work that you guys are doing every day, because this is not a Democrat or a Republican issue. It's a Wisconsin issue. And when people are literally getting cancer and getting sick and it's polluting our riverways and our public lands and our lands in general, um, we can't sit on the sidelines and be complacent about this. Um, and we've got to uh, demand action. Tia, do you have any thoughts on what we can do to overcome this? Well, I, I would um, uh, point out that the Clean Air Act, which I think was adopted in 1972, and I believe passed the United States Senate uh, with uh, uh, not a single no vote, or there might have been uh, one single no vote. So Democrats and Republicans alike, it was signed into law by uh, President Richard uh, Nixon, um, uh, a conservative uh, Republican. So in 1972, there was the political will, the understanding that everyone um, uh, needs uh, clean water to thrive. Industry needs it individuals need it, families need it, communities need it. And um, I, I it, it, as Sarah said, it puzzles the heck out of me. Um, I, I, I feel a, a bit more optimistic in that um, uh, we have seen both the governor and uh, certain um, uh, legislative uh, uh, majority members um, talk about these critical issues. Um, uh, and at this point, you know, the, it's not a very sophisticated answer, but I, I, can, I can simply say that uh, amplifying the voices of individuals in their communities and using their voice to express this as a priority to their elected officials uh, is critical. And I believe that municipal officials in particular can help um, uh, persuade uh, the legislature to take um, uh, greater leadership action on, on that issue. The other thing, Kathy, too, I just want to chime in too from Tia is that, I mean, there right now is a piece of PFAS legislation um, by uh, a Republican member of the General Assembly. And, you know, I think one of the questions that I throw to all the Sierra Club members today is that the reason that it hasn't gotten bipartisan support is there's no holding corporations accountable for the PFAS that they are putting into our uh, waterways or into our communities. Um, and it's more just about kind of testing and then dealing with it as is. And so I think something that we also have to kind of address as a larger community is how far do we want to push the envelope? What is acceptable? What's not? Um, as we look at this too, from like a pragmatic standpoint. Um, but that's a reason currently why there hasn't been support on the other side is because um, in a lot of people's view, it misses a core uh, component, which is the corporations that have started this from the first place when we think about PFAS and, um, and the environment. And that's something I was wondering about too, was um, corporate influence 
Tia, do you think that corporate influence has grown over the years? I mean, you mentioned that there used to be bipartisan support for things like clean water and clean air, and it seems like it's so much more of a challenge now. Does that have to do with corporate influence, do you think? Oh, I, I think there's no question that, it, I mean, I, I'm ex expressive personal opinion, I, it, uh, but I think it, there's no question that the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, um, uh, ruling that uh, corporations uh, uh, can give unlimited money um, uh, uh, to campaigns uh, has had a uh, pernicious effect on our democracy and uh, good government uh, in this country. Um, corporations have always played a, a significant role in uh, regulatory matters uh, uh, of government uh, uh, wherever uh, they may be, um, but uh, big corporate money, um, unlimited amounts, uh, untraceable donors, um, this has had a, a really pernicious effect. I, I'd say I, I tried to recruit my uh, a, a good friend um, who happened to have been a Republican and a, a strong environmentalist to join a, a, a board because I think it's important to have a diversity of voices uh, in all manner uh, of speaking. And uh, this individual I won't identify said to me, Tia, um, in, uh, until I die, I am working on two issues and two issues only, and they affect everything you care about. They are overturning Citizens United and getting fair district drawing maps and uh, uh, in the most, you know, probably the most gerrymandered state um, uh, in the country. And uh, uh, I thought that was a really interesting observation uh, to make. So, you know, um, uh, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. Um, our next question, many organizations and institutions across the country, including the Sierra Club, are increasingly recognizing the importance of equity and environmental justice to their work, something that has not historically been a strength of most conservation organizations or governments. We have a slightly different question related to this for each of you. First for Tia, have you noticed any change over time in how equity and environmental justice are handled either by government or nonprofits? And then for Sarah, have you seen any examples of equity and justice being incorporated into environmental policies or decisions in the state? Well, I, um, I have seen um, significant change, important change. It's um, come, uh, too slowly, in, in my opinion, I, I would just a brief historical reference, which I think is very important. On the eve of the first Earth Day, my father gave a speech in Milwaukee. And he said, ecology is a big science, not a narrow science. It involves the worst environments in America, in the inner cities and in Appalachia. It involves rats in the ghetto and public housing unworthy of its name. His call to action 51 years ago was broadly written to include this social justice question. I think the environmental community flat out failed to hear that part of his message and um, has taken too long um, uh, to address issues of disparity in, in how pollution has affected poorer communities in this country. Um, but I'm heartened by the resonance and the strength of that movement today. Um, I think a, a enormous progress has been made. I would point out as someone who worked in a very large NGO, um, uh, very well-funded uh, NGO um, that all of the big environmental groups have a challenge in front of them um, uh, to go beyond lip service and, and really embrace diversity, equity, inclusion, 
the environmental justice challenge that has been before us for, for so long that my father identified more than 50 years ago. And um, it's gonna take a lot of effort. And there's a lot of uh, uh, institutional challenges uh, uh, as well. It's the people who know best about what's happening in the community are not typically the large national based uh, environmental NGOs, which I proudly have, you know, worked for for almost 20 years. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work to be done there, but there's been enormous uh, uh, progress and it's, I think, um, getting a resonance today, um, uh, well-deserved, um, uh, um, but uh, delayed um, in terms of reflecting my father's vision. Sarah, how's our government doing on this currently? Well, I can um, just talk about it, at least from my lens and what we have been doing. Um, so there's a few, I think, uh, points that we can continue to build from. You know, part of it goes back to we uh, how we manage our $1.2 billion investment fund. And we when we redid our investment policy statement, which is otherwise referred to as an IPS, uh, we incorporated what's called ESG factors. It stands for environmental, social, and governance standards. And those are not necessary. They're not like siloed factors. You look at environmental factors. You're also looking at your social factors. Uh, do communities of color have uh, voices at the table? How are they incorporated? Are they a part of the decision-making process? Because something that we have seen more and more is that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu and part of addressing, I believe, climate equity is making sure there is an active voice uh, knowing um, how this can impact them. And so incorporating these ESG factors and the work that we do, I think is also very, very important and an opportunity uh, to continue to grow beyond just our work uh, when I look at our current um, funds. You know, the other thing is um, let's even talk about housing. You know, we just launched recently, uh, it's called Take Root Wisconsin. And it is um, a program that is helping people buy, fix, and stay in their homes. And I want to emphasize the fix part, because that's particularly something that is not thought of when we are thinking about housing. It's always about how can we put down a down payment or help somebody buy a new home. But a lot of things that um, communities uh, of color are struggling with is how are they actually getting rid of the asbestos in their homes? How are they actually getting their lead paint out of their homes? Um, and this is not something that's often included as part of a, a housing work. And it impacts um, the health and also the environment of those communities. And so that is something um, that we ensured was that we can't allow, uh, we can't make it acceptable that folks are living in these in these homes and how can we provide resources and opportunities um, to address it. And so I think that was something that you might not think about housing and the environment and equity linked together, but there is actually um, a very clear link. And I think something that we have now started addressing um, statewide with uh, Take Root Wisconsin. Um, as well as with, there's another group called Take Root, Take Root um, Milwaukee. That's great to hear. Our next question was submitted by one of our attendees tonight, and it relates back to climate change. Forests are so important for carbon sequestration, which will help us manage our, the climate changes we're going to see. What are the challenges and opportunities for BCPL's forest management strategy going forward? Whoever wants to take this one first, go for it. I, I uh, with, uh, I'll, I'll jump on it as someone who um, spent um, uh, uh, over a decade at the Nature Conservancy working on the important role that forests <clears throat> protection and restoration and forest management uh, plays as a climate solution. I don't think um, many people know that globally um, deforestation um, and uh, agriculture um, emit as much, uh, in, uh, as many tons of greenhouse gases uh, as the global electricity sector. 
20, uh, 24%, so in elect electricity is 25%. So forest protection, restoration, improved timber management is a critical and essential climate solution. And we're at such a pickle on the climate uh, challenge today. We need every tool in the toolbox. That includes energy policy. It includes agriculture policy. It includes forest management policy. And um, BCPL, uh, this was something that I thought a lot about. It's uh, uh, why, uh, you know, the reason why I got attacked for talking about climate change during work hours, which they, I mean, it, it strains, you know, rational thinking to say that climate change doesn't impa impact the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands portfolio as managers of 80,000 acres of land. So uh, BCPL, and I'm, this is probably my proudest accomplishment uh, there, and, and this work has been continued by the uh, uh, Tom German, who's now the uh, executive secretary, and, and Sarah and the rest of the board. Uh, we passed with unanimously, and I worked my butt off on this, and I'm quite proud of it. Um, we passed in the legislature unanimously legislation to allow BCPL to consolidate its lands and improve uh, its uh, forest health and timber management uh, and, and uh, timber productivity. Um, so how we manage our forests is a really important um, uh, issue. Now, BCPL isn't, uh, you know, a huge landowner, 80,000 acres, may, it, you know, uh, sounds like a lot. The DNR, gosh, I used to have the numbers uh, right at my fingertips. The counties are the largest landowner. The county forests are the largest uh, forest land owners in Wisconsin, um, uh, followed by uh, the state. So BCPL is a smaller player, but protecting forests, um, restoring forests, improving timber management is an is a important climate solution. And BCPL has used every tool it has uh, to play uh, a, a small but important role in leading on those uh, fronts. And uh, I'm very proud of the work I started there and I'm very proud of uh, uh, Tom and Sarah and the board for uh, continuing that work. And Kathy, if I can just continue because I mean, the BCPL is where it is um, because of Tia's leadership on this issue. I mean, just to kind of put it in perspective, uh, you know, the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands, uh, how it even formed was because when Wisconsin got its public lands to be a state, it was the BCPL's role to really manage this public land, to figure out when it could be sold, when it could not, and then those proceeds went to um, our public schools. But today, as Tia said, there are 80, a little over 80,000 acres of uh, land across 33 counties in our state. And what's so unique about this is that this is land that has been preserved since 1848. And so it is incredibly important because it has some of the most unique kind of uh, ecological features, whether we're talking about old growth forests or, you know, class one trout streams. And Tia saw this and said, I don't want this to ever be an issue moving forward. And so some like we established comprehensive conservation management plans, for example, where we looked at, you know, how are you protecting rare species and wetlands? And we now have like a forest stewardship management cert certification. Um, we also do sustainable forest regeneration, where over, you know, the past, I don't know now, Tia, it's been decades, we've planted hundreds of thousands of trees. Um, because how important that is. Um, and then we've improved access to public lands. Um, you know, most recently uh, on the Nimicogon River where we were able to uh, give the last portion of unprotected um, land to that the BCPL owned to the National Forest Service. So that will now be protected forever. So I think I just wanted to kind of put things in perspective because um, before this kind of ecological mindset did not exist uh, before Tia Nelson led the BCPL. And I think it's incredibly important as we move forward, we continue to um, embrace that because of such a unique opportunity um, with these public lands that are under our ownership. 
Kathy, if I could, uh, uh, Sarah, you're now better at answering the question than I am, which is uh, uh, <laughs> I commend you for and express embarrassment for. One of the points I, I, I should have made was B with this law, BCPL was able to ensure that uh, old growth forests were protected by uh, being put into a new um, uh, natural areas uh, uh, status, um, uh, which is really great. And I saw in the chat a uh, question about agriculture. And I would just say uh, briefly as we wrap up this question as needed, um, agriculture has a critical role to play in addressing climate change. Um, uh, uh, equal to that of uh, forests. And Wisconsin is in a unique position to lead there. Now, BCPL doesn't have a, ro a particular role because they're not involved uh, in uh, managing ag lands, but um, the, the beauty of that opportunity is that improving ag practices that sequester more carbon in our soil uh, that reduce a uh, fertilizer application, which, which is a greenhouse gas emission source. Um, uh, these practices, which will sequester carbon, prevent uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the ag sector, have all of these co-benefits, not the least of which is significant water quality benefits, right? So I think, and, and, and uh, Secretary Vilsack, the Ag Secretary and, um, uh, under President Biden, uh, I, his, his climate person is a dear old friend of mine. He worked at the Environmental Defense Fund when I was at Nature Conservancy. Robert Bonney, under Vilsack's leadership, is doing amazing work. A lot of resources are going to come to the state of Wisconsin to help them uh, work on these issues. It creates enormous opportunities to both address climate change and water quality issues in the ag sector. There's a lot of great work to be done there, and I'm, I'm excited about it. Sarah, do you have any thoughts on how agriculture and conservation can work together as opposed to being enemies? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I was actually recently visiting um, a farm in the Driftless area, and they have been just hit time and time again by erratic weather. You know, they actually experienced two years in a row flash floods that wiped out their entire crop. And this is a farm that has been in Wisconsin for five generations. And so they're saying, we've got to do something about climate change. And so part of it is we, we would like a voice, a voice at this table because we really believe that our insight about sustainable agriculture um, could really help um, because we are impacted every single day by climate change. I mean, this farmer for me was asking, you know, I'm trying to figure out if I sh can even do this. Like maybe this is the final generation. Um, and I think when we look at the, farm bill, I think there's opportunities that we can write in, you know, the farm bill has not evolved for almost a century. And so as we look into the 21st century, how can we look at the farm bill in a way that maybe rewards these sustainable practices um, and, and make it kind of front and center. Um, and I think that there's um, some opportunities uh, to do that. That would be great. That would help our state and our environment, I think. Our final question tonight uh, was also submitted by one of our attendees. Do you feel hopeful that government can make progress in improving environmental quality? And if so, what gives you hope? Who wants to tackle this one first? I, I, I'm uh, happy to, to take it and, and then let uh, uh, Sarah close us out. Um, I think about this question a lot. I've been an environmental advocate for um, my entire adult life. Um, if you're not distressed right now, you, you know, you're not paying attention. Um, we're in a really challenging time. Uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. What gives me hope um, really is 
um, the stories that I have uh, borne witness to, starting with the first Earth Day. 20 million people gathered on that day, responding to my father's call to action. But it wasn't just a, a great speech given by a great orator and a great leader at a perfect time. It was those things. But it never would have precipitated the outcome, which was unimaginable to my father. Earth Day was successful beyond his wildest dreams. He had no one, he, he thought it would, he asked teachers to set aside a day to teach about the environment. That was his call to action. And instead, 20 million people across this country, the largest secular event in American history occurred. And it occurred because of individual action. Not because my dad gave a great speech, which was critical, but because people in their communities, and my father specifically didn't put forward a set of issues or an agenda uh, in his call to action. He told people to do whatever made sense in their community. He empowered them and gave them a sense of agency to act from their values in their community around the issues that concern them. Individuals made Earth Day the success it was and changed the course of American history. That outcome was unimaginable to my father. Just as Rosa Parks never could have imagined she would change the course of American history and the uh, trajectory of civil rights legislation in this country through a simple act of quiet defiance by refusing to go to the back of the bus during a time of segregation in the South. Any more than Greta Thunberg could have known that sitting alone by herself without saying a word, holding a sign, in front of the Swedish legislature would launch a global youth movement that is thriving today. These were unimaginable outcomes. They came from single acts of principle and engagement and courage, and they changed history. Individual action matters. We all have the power to make a difference and that will always make me hopeful. Well, and I will tell you, Tia, I mean, you took the words out of my mouth because I was just going to say that's something I think about a lot is what Margaret Mead said, where never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world because indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And throughout our conversation today, that's what we've been talking about, whether it is Senator Gaylord Nelson, who was fighting for Earth Day before we were even really talking about it and saying this is something that we have to address um, and change the voice of the Senate and, 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 and literally change the outlook on how we talk about it to even Tia's role as the Board of Commissioner of Public Lands Executive Director where she literally set our ecological policy and how we manage our public lands um, to all of you uh, that are here with us today um, as part of the Sierra Club. And so I think it is, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful because I think, you know, I would have never imagined that my first action as an elected official was overturning a gag order um, and then starting to invest in renewable energy. But these are the things that we can make a difference with. And uh, when I look at Wisconsin and when I read, for example, that La Follette poll that said this is the number one issue that Wisconsinites care about, I'm really hopeful that together um, we're going to be able to think creatively, demand change, and um, it, it's, it's going to happen because um, our future our future depends on it. And I'm just, you know, Kathy, so thankful for you and your leadership and for the work of all of the members of the Sierra Club um, because we just can't sit on the sidelines when it comes to protecting our environment. And on that note, we've reached the end of our time tonight. Um, thank you so much again to our guests, Sierra and Tia not only for joining us and sharing your inspiration tonight, but for all that you've done and will continue to do for Wisconsin. Thank you to everyone for attending tonight. If this conversation has inspired you to get more involved in government advocacy, 
Our Wisconsin chapter has both a legislative committee and a political electoral committee plus a budget committee in state budget years. And Cassie has put a link to the committee page in the chat where you can get more information and sign up for those. Uh, I'm sure you also could learn more about those committees at the chapter's virtual volunteer fair on February 3rd. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye, everyone.